Hey everyone, welcome back to Installation 00, and as promised, it's Wednesday and I'm delivering another Gold vs Silver. Episode 5 of the Halo TV series launches in the UK today, so in continuing this new series, let's look at Episode 5 and the comparison of the Silver Timeline lore and the lore from the mainline canon, games and books that I'm calling the Gold Timeline. And with that said, let's get on with it. We open Episode 5 with scenes depicting John as a young boy before his kidnapping and Dr. Halsey and Jacob Keyes posing as parents looking to put their child in the school. This draws direct parallels to the Gold Timeline in that when vetting the candidates for the Spartan 2 program, Dr. Halsey, escorted by Jacob Keyes, did visit Eridnus 2 to assess John. They found John and the other candidates through a free vaccination service. The used needles were recovered and trace blood of all vaccinated children were analysed, looking for specific genetic markers that Dr. Halsey had discovered had the best odds of surviving the process of becoming a Spartan, both physically and mentally. From a genetic standpoint, the candidates that were chosen were the best of the best. 150 candidates were identified from this genetic testing, and then teams were dispatched to identify and assess the candidates. John was the 117th genetic sample that was found to be ideal for the program, hence his new identity being John 117, although funding was only approved for 75 of the original 150, but that explains why all Spartans have their first name and a numerical or alphanumerical identifier as their last name. The differences that are present, however, between the Silver and Gold timeline are that in the Gold timeline, John was seen playing King of the Hill. John was a head taller than all the other kids, and was holding the top of the hill against all other competition. Even when teamed up against, John holds his own, and kicks and punches and throws and bites his way to success. In this regard, he's a bit of a bruiser and a bully. He had won 45 consecutive matches of this brutal version of King of the Hill, which saw John having a chipped tooth and his opponents incurring various broken bones. But this aggressive, bully-like personality is shaped over his military career into a disciplined and focused warrior. In the Silver Timeline, John is actually holding his ground while another child, in this scenario the bully, shakes a rope ladder high up in the trees, kicking out at John and trying to make him fall. John, despite being significantly smaller than this other child, manages to grab his leg as he falls and hold his entire weight with one arm. Oddly, the bully in this scenario actually bears a closer resemblance to the young John from the Gold Timeline. In the Gold Timeline, six-year-old John had short, mousy brown hair, blue eyes, larger physical proportions, he was a head taller than the other children and had a gap between his two front teeth, mirroring the description of the boy that John caught in the Silver Timeline, versus John in the Silver Timeline who has dark brown hair, brown eyes, is of average height but seemingly in possession of superior strength and reflexes of the ideal genetic candidate. We also have a brief scene where Keyes looks to John, and a look of concern and doubt plays across his face, telegraphing his understanding of exactly why they are there to assess John. Keyes was picked by Halsey as her chaperone, pilot, personal guard, and UNSC liaison because he was capable of keeping a secret. He had, previous to their first meeting, been present when a commanding officer made a bad call during a training operation that resulted in the deaths of 14 ensigns and saw Keyes getting badly burned by plasma and having to spend two months in hospital recovering and rehabilitating. Keyes refused to testify against his instructor and was promptly demoted for it, but this ability to keep a secret was what drew Halsey's attention. Keyes likely partially understood the implications of his involvement in the acquisition of the early candidates, but rapidly understood more about it. After a while, and as he and Halsey began developing feelings, she had him transferred away from the program, likely to protect him from the inevitable backlash whenever that would occur. They'd later meet on a few occasions, one such occasion resulting in Keyes and Halsey developing a brief romantic relationship that resulted in their daughter Miranda. In the Silver Timeline, Keyes remained relatively intimately involved with the program for much longer than the Gold Timeline, however their relationship fizzled out in the same manner it did in the Gold Timeline, being due to Halsey's fixation on her work, her willingness to sacrifice everything for her work, and her tendency to sabotage or neglect her relationships, be it private, professional, familial, or indeed romantic. We next see a brief scene on Arandus 2, and then we cut to the opening credits and come back to Quan and Soren's story, which again diverges from the Gold Timeline completely in that they don't exist in the Gold Timeline. 
We see Chief and Kai briefly discuss the removal of her hormone regulation pellet, and then we're back on Madrigal for McKee assessing the location of the first foreigner artifact. This is chased by a brief shot of Quan escaping custody, and we're back with Chief as he confides in Keys about what he saw during his memories of his childhood family home. Keys all the while quietly knowing the truth already. Again, we're dealing with the knock-on effects of the fundamental narrative differences between the gold and silver timeline. The gold timeline made the choice to tell the Spartans the truth about the nature of their conscription and what was going to happen to them. This bred trust and resolve into the Spartans and saw them never really needing to question anything as fundamental as their origins because they were told the truth from the get-go. The Silver Timeline made the choice to lie to the Spartans about the nature of their conscription. In both timelines, illegal Flash clones were used. In both timelines, the children were kidnapped. And in both timelines, the children were trained and underwent unethical augmentations to turn them into Spartans, which resulted in the death of nearly half of them. The only real difference is that the Gold Timeline Spartans were told the truth about it all, and thus learned they could trust the word of their COs and the UNSC, and the Silver Timeline Spartans were lied to, controlled and manipulated, breeding into them a distrust of their seniors and commanding officers should the truth ever come out. The thing about lies is that the lie can only hold true for as long as the truth remains hidden. If at any point the truth comes out, the lie falls apart. The Silver Timeline deals with this reality quite well, especially in the case of compounded lies that are commonplace for pathological liars, of which the Silver Dr. Halsey is most definitely one. Halsey actually fits the profile of a narcissistic sociopath quite perfectly. This makes the characterization of Halsey very relevant because we are seeing an increase in the public displays of narcissistic abuse and abusers. It has become more common and a term more widely known and used in society to give name and description to a subset of human psychology that is evidently much more common than first thought. And Silver Halsey ticks all of the boxes. Also, just a little note, there's a link in the description for 10 signs of a narcissistic sociopath. If you've got time, have a little read through and just see how many of those boxes are ticked in Halsey's case. Moving on from this, we see the second artifact being probed with a laser and it responds by sending out a pulse and a resonant frequency which perforates the eardrums of those nearest to it. It's not unusual for foreigner devices to have systems around them which serve to either keep them hidden or keep unwanted attention away. The Didact's Cryptum on Earth, for example, was hidden in Jamonkin Crater, a location here on Earth. The entire area was protected by foreigner bafflers, which optically masked any activity happening within it. The body of water inside the crater was populated by Merce, an aggressive carnivorous aquatic species, and even the final journey directly to the cryptum required walking a very specific path to avoid being killed by elaborate traps. So this device's sonic frequency could be considered a defense mechanism to drive away unwanted attention. The sound doesn't seem to have an effect on Chief at all, unless it's just because he's wearing his helmet, and the sound is more damaging the closer to the source you are. The sound stops as Chief takes off his helmet, and it's unknown if the sound stops because it recognised Chief as a reclaimer, or the crystalline shell fell away as though it was intended to function that way, that it created that resonant frequency to break the shell so it fell away and then turns off once it does, or if the sound was only designed to emanate for a predetermined period of time. We then get to the part where Chief begins to ask Cortana to access any and all data files on him and the Spartan program, and Cortana, despite being the most advanced human AI in existence and having access to the entirety of human collected knowledge, cannot find any records of John or the Spartan program. She seems genuinely curious and confused. This falls in line with just how clandestine the Office of Naval Intelligence can be. On the surface, Oni appears to most, including the interpretation of Oni so far seen in the show, as simply an intelligence gathering and analysis arm of the UNSC. In reality, the Office of Naval Intelligence is a powerful, compartmentalised military industrial complex capable of gathering and leveraging intelligence for tactical and strategic defence of their own interests. They operate with little to no official oversight, have access to nearly inexhaustible financial backing, can and have made unimaginable advances in technology which they've kept hidden from humanity at large, they are experienced in the art of subterfuge, counterintelligence, deception, manipulation of information, propaganda, and control of humanity at large. They are the men in black, the CIA, and the Illuminati all rolled into one. 
They made great efforts to eliminate, take over or dissolve any competitor intelligence gathering organisation and keep secrets in relation to their activities and are willing and able to make individuals, groups, organisations and corporations disappear if they deem them a threat to the status quo. We have only seen a tiny flicker of Oni so far and I hope that in time we see more of just how evil Oni can be. I hope the show gets the opportunity to explore a narrative in which Oni become the enemy as they rightly have been in the gold timeline, but thus far no one powerful enough has realised and made it their task to take them down. Chief may yet be on his way to do exactly that. For now however John realises all of the lies that he's been told by Dr Halsey that she has been there quietly controlling and manipulating his life behind the scenes since he was 6 years old. He recalls from touching the artefact that he was kidnapped and replaced with a Flash clone. He remembers that Cortana informed him that the entire planet's population died from a plague, which could quite easily have also been manufactured by Halsey in the Office of Naval Intelligence, and he realises that Halsey did this to 75 other children, 75 other families, 75 of his fellow brothers and sisters in arms, his fellow Spartans. There are even fractured moments of recollection of some of, the, of his fellow Spartans horrifically disfigured and dead from the augmentation procedures, and all of this happened as a consequence of Halsey and her actions. Add to this the fact that Chief is feeling all of this properly for the first time because he removed the spinal implant that regulated his hormones, and that most of these emotions are new and novel to him, and finally coming to his senses after all of this, and seeing Halsey stood in front of him as she tries to shut down his statements about the kidnapping as she desperately attempts to convince him that they'll talk about it later, again trying to control him and what happens next. It's hardly surprising, he's moved to rage, although this is a loud, aggressive, noisy rage uh, displayed by John and the lunge for a punch was a little overkill when a slow deliberate predatory walk would have sufficed and given the same kind of level of tension. Chief and the other Spartans have felt rage before in the gold timeline, but it's been a cold, methodical rage. And they took that cold rage out on the Covenant, when they saw the Covenant hunting, killing and in some circumstances eating the survivors for sport. The Spartans deployed to the planet and hunted down every last Covenant member on the planet, refusing to leave until they were all dead. Quan and Soren's story still isn't really doing a whole lot, but then we're back with Chief when the Covenant sharp on Eridanus 2. The UNSC ship holding position above the area is a Halberd class destroyer. At first sight, I thought that the destroyer had been taken down by Banshee fire as I'm sure many of you did too. This should be impossible, because Banshee fire wouldn't be sufficient to take down a ship with over 2 meters of Titanium A armor plating on her hull. The Banshee guns just are not powerful enough to burn through that and cause the destruction that we see on this Halberd class destroyer. However, upon re-watching, the destroyer is absent from the skies around the camp for the entirety of the rest of the episode beforehand, since shortly after the destroyer falls, what appears to be a CCS class battlecruiser descends from above. This leads me to the conclusion that the destroyer was actually at a very high altitude or low orbit around the planet and was engaged by the Covenant ship and shot down. She fell down through the atmosphere and smashed into the planet in view of the entire camp. This makes a damn sight more sense than being shot down by Banshee fire, and is more in keeping with the level of damage we see the ship has taken on. Next, Spartans really can run as fast as Warthogs can drive, to a point. On average they can run at 32 miles an hour but have been known to be able to sprint significantly faster if necessary. Chief being able to jump the way that he does between the Warthog and the Banshee is also perfectly within Spartan capabilities in the gold timeline, as well as being strong enough to hold himself onto the Banshee as it rolls by one hand and a very, very small handhold. In truth, Spartans have been known to make their own handholds by putting their fists through hull plating in order to get secure, and the impact against the Phantom at high speed and still surviving is again within Spartan capability. More precisely, it's within Mjolnir capability. The Mjolnir Mark VI suit that Chief is wearing is capable of increasing a Spartan's reaction by 5, 
bearing in mind a Spartan's augmented reaction, is already three times faster than a normal human average. It is also capable of increasing their strength by a factor of five, again bearing in mind that Spartan's augmented strength already enables them to lift three times their body weight which itself is twice the base normal, making them six times stronger than the average base human. And finally, Mjolnir possesses a hydrostatic gel layer. The hydrostatic gel is a hydrogelatin or a water based gel. It's generally speaking blue in colour and serves the purpose of regulating temperature as well as conforming to the wearer's body for a better fit within the suit. It can also be pressurised to protect the wearer from high g-forces, large impacts and zero ambient pressure. The gel, generally speaking, automatically adjusts this pressure based on what the sensor arrays of the suit are telling it, and can also be manually overwritten and overpressured to protect the wearer should it be necessary, although it does run the risk of inducing a nitrogen embolism. The gel has enabled Spartans to survive falls from great heights, extreme g-forces up to 38 g, and even falls from space. Last, but certainly not least, the brute that arrives on the battlefield to extract the artifact has been confirmed as being Atriox. Atriox has a rich and colourful past in the gold timeline, bathed in blood. He was loyal to the Covenant for a long time and, well, I'll let Isabel tell you about him. During the war, the Covenant used his clan as expendable muscle told them dying in battle would speed their holy journey. Forty at a time, they carelessly sent them in. Forty to break the front lines. Forty to die for beliefs not their own. None ever returned. Until he did. And so battle by battle, War by war, 39 brothers at a time, Atriox was born. With every victory, his legend and his hatred of the Covenant grew. Eventually both were impossible to conceal, and they tried to banish him and everything we know about the Covenant's thousand-year history. Atriox was the first to defy the Covenant and survive. And his defiance inspired others. Now we aren't given exact timescales on when exactly Atriox grew to resent the Covenant and rose up against them, but one can hope something similar happens in the TV show, and we're seeing Atriox before he makes that fateful decision of becoming the leader of the Banished. Adding another faction to this TV series as the seasons progress would be spectacular for the possibilities and possible directions that the story could go. And that more or less rounds out episode 5. What did you think of episode 5 in general? What do you think about the comparisons between the gold and silver lore in relation to this particular episode? And is there anything you think I missed that perhaps I should cover in the next episode, which will air on Wednesday next week, in line with episode 6 being released? Until then, comment sections down below, relevant links are in the description. Take it easy everyone, and find Pete in the domain. Thanks for watching, commenting, liking and subscribing. I just want to give a quick shout out to my patrons and YouTube members, Spartan10148, my Metarch, Dylan, FalconX003, Kenwood, Irrefutable Justice, Leon, Neek and Ramiz, my monitors, Alvin, Andrew, Brand, Brian, Cameron, Chris, Darian, Devon, Flaming Halo, Greenblood, Kyle, Legions Lost, Michael, Prophet Bear, Spartan and Wolf, my sub-monitors, my fleet of Strato Sentinels, my diligent enforcers.
and all the other awesome people that have jumped aboard to support the channel over at Patreon. Another shout out to Todd Morrison, my transcendent YouTube member. And just one quick reminder to support us on all major social media channels, including Discord. Much love from Zero Zero. Take it easy, everyone, and find peace in the domain. <laughs>